we have plenty of clients who are still employed and we reach out to the company and we're like, look, the ball's in your court. What do you want to do? And by that point, frankly, if the person wants to leave, it's always negotiable. I mean, it's easier for the company. If they want you to go away, they'll pay you to go away. But if they want to stay and we just want the company to do better and we tell them that, a lot of times they will do better. Or if they don't, then they're even more on notice. And so, yes, you can get more money. But I just think in these situations, you have to just put yourself in your mental health first, especially when we're talking about widows and family obligations. You owe it to yourself to do what's best for yourself in your life. Welcome to Financially Ever After Widowhood, the podcast where we empower women to take control of their financial future after the loss of a spouse. I'm your host, Stacey Francis, President and CEO of Francis Financial, an award-winning and nationally recognized financial advisory firm. With the help of incredible guests, I'm ready to guide you through this challenging transition. Welcome to Financially Ever After. Today, we're talking about a serious topic. Four in 10 U.S. women have experienced discrimination at work because of their gender. This is according to Pew Research Center. Well, I can nearly guarantee that that number is even higher for widows. If you haven't listened to the episode before where we talk about the stories widows share about their personal discrimination in the workforce after the death of their spouse, I highly encourage you to do so. Today, we're going to be talking to two fantastic professionals who will be giving important information to all of you who are thinking about re-entering the workforce after the death of your spouse, returning to the workforce, and what to do if you are facing discrimination. Kelly Joyce is our first guest today. And she helps professionals discover their career path and land their dream job. She's a career coach to individuals who want to radically change their relationship with work. She's dedicated her talents to healing issues such as job transition, job search, performance management, and mental health. And she blends her marketing and communication executive management expertise with her beautifully intuitive coaching skills to serve clients in many high competitive and pressure filled industries. Susan Crumler is a mother of two and the founding attorney of Crumler, which is a feminist litigation firm in Brooklyn, New York. She's well known for representing victims in high profile workplace discrimination and sexual abuse lawsuits. She was a trial lawyer for 15 years and she originally started her firm as a pregnancy rights law firm in 2016, after her ex-boss pressured her to return to work while she was supposed to be out on maternity leave. Her firm has since expanded to represent workers and women in all types of employment lawsuits, sexual abuse survivors, and victims of medical abuse in labor and delivery settings. And she has many stories of widows as well who have faced abuse. These are two important, fantastic experts that we have here helping you be able to start your career after a long hiatus, re-enter the workforce, or go back to work after the death of a spouse. They give important information on how you can make sure that you succeed in your career, that you have the opportunities and financial compensation that you deserve, and what to do if, unfortunately, you are seeing that your responsibilities are being curtailed, you're being marginalized out of the career progression that you deserve, potentially demoted or even fired. This is a episode that is a not to miss. And I just want to say a great big thank you to our fantastic experts who are here today. Without further ado, please help me welcome Kelly and Susan. We are so excited to have you here, Kelly and Susan, to talk about a topic that 
most people are not talking about. In fact, when I was doing research to just really see what the statistics were for women losing a spouse, going back into the workforce, and unfortunately, discrimination, there's nothing. Almost like this discrimination doesn't exist, but I think that the three of us can agree that it does. So I just want to say a great big warm welcome to you, Kelly, and to you as well, Susan. So great to be here. Thank you. So I'm going to ask you first, Kelly, for all of you listening to the introduction that I just gave for Kelly, she is an expert in the area of helping people either relaunch their career or within a career, move within it, find greater satisfaction. But Kelly, what I'd love to talk about first for some widows, their spouse passes away and they don't have a career that they have been working in and are finding themselves because of this unbelievable, difficult loss and then income loss because of it, having to go back into the workforce. So what is the first step that she needs to think about if she's returning to work and hasn't been working for some time? Well, the first step in any job search or going back into career is to ask yourself why. It's finding what your big why is, your motivation. Sometimes figuring out if going back to work even makes sense is something that comes even before that. But most of us go to work for reasons. We go to work, maybe it's for money. Maybe it's for satisfaction and fulfillment or challenge or whatever it is. Maybe the reason to go back is super obvious because the mortgage is due. But maybe in other situations, it might be kind of half and half. Like, you know, we could stay at home for a year or two and be okay and give us a runway to figure it out and things like that. The why is really all about that. And then kind of moving into like, what are really my options? Maybe there is something that you could stand on that you did 20 years ago, even though the world looks really different and things like that. Or maybe that just doesn't even exist anymore and it's time to take out the top 10 hot jobs of 2023 and dig right into that and figure out if you can even afford to work. And I think for a lot of women, when they're needing to go back to work, it's because they have children. I was looking at the statistic today, the average age of widowhood, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, is a young age 59. A lot of those are single moms now. They're finding themselves the sole breadwinner to support these children. One of these women I was actually talking to today, and I'm going to be introducing Kelly to her. And one of the questions that she had was, I don't want to leave my children at home. They are school age, so they're going to go to school. But can I even have a career where I'm able to work during the day while they're at school and be able to be with them because they've gone through trauma. So Kelly, what are the things that you need to think about? Are there certain careers or is that even possible this day and age where you can work in those part-time hours? Yeah, I mean, first of all, thinking about it from the framework of the family is numero uno. What does my family need? What do the kids need? And then, you know, when am I available? So maybe that's nights, maybe that's Mm -hmm. weekends, maybe it's nine to two, pretty common amount of time. So if you say you have, I don't know, 30 hours, 25 hours, maybe that looks like job sharing. Maybe that looks like consulting about something that maybe anyone would pay you for. And I'd probably get pushback saying, well, I don't have any skills and I don't know how to do that. Well, you know how to do something, I can assure you. This is where businesses are also great. Sometimes people say, oh, job or career, but this is you know how you see women working from home, working from scratch, or doing a franchise or any of these types of things where they could be at home and make good money. I wouldn't say no to anything in the beginning. I would lay it all out and then say, what can we do here? That makes a lot of sense. And Kelly, what I'm hearing from you is that having flexibility, there are jobs out there, even in corporate America, really everywhere, whether it's you starting your own business, you working for a smaller business, you job sharing in corporate America, things like that, but that don't let us create barriers that aren't necessarily there. Absolutely. I mean, we have the right to negotiate, to ask, 
push limits. You're fighting for your family. You're fighting for your financial health, but it doesn't cost you anything to ask. Yeah. So for the woman who is listening and you kind of were sharing a little bit about some of the things that she might be thinking about, when am I going to put on my resume? Maybe she was active in the PTA. Uh -huh. Maybe, I don't know. But where do you start? And for her in particular, who maybe doesn't have a big network that she's been able to build in her career, how does she get a job? We always start where we are. I like to just do a big level set in the beginning. I roll it all the way back. Did you finish high school? Did you like, I mean, I do the whole history with people. Yeah. There are skills everywhere. A lot of people, and I don't just mean widows, people, when I work with them around their worth and their value, everyone downplays it. So when you say I ran the bake sale at the PTA and it's like, oh, it was just the bake sale. It's like, no, you did the marketing, you raised the money, you organized yeah. the whole gosh darn thing. Those are skills and we got to run with them. And I will tell you from a business owner perspective, someone coming in, even if they haven't been working for quite a few years compared to someone right out of college, I find that that person who has experienced more maturity, they just fly through our career ladder. It's amazing. And it's so exciting. And so I just want to share that too uh, for all the women listening who are working on that confidence. Because from an employer perspective, those are my favorite. And career changers, oh my God. I'm just so excited to work with someone that is like that. I just want to chime in just as a business owner too, because we're hiring a few positions right now. And it's one of those things where judgment and experience is so invaluable. You know, when you were talking about the bake sale, it's funny because I've never been involved in a bake sale. And so I'm sure the people are all really lovely. But my first thought was, oh, and navigating all the personalities. I was just thinking about all the politics involved in any kind of sort of endeavor yes. and how those sort of skills that we're all getting better at articulating, that's what we need in business. <laughs> so I think Stacey it just made a really good point that those are highly valued skills. I agree with you, Susan. And I would say that also hiring a coach is so important too, in the sense of like, don't do this on your own. Don't do this on your own for sure. Make sure that it's not just you. And some of this is just differentiation between the different kinds of skills. There's hard skills, which are the things that we do that might be right or sell, but a soft skill like mature <laughs> or dedicated is magic to the ears of a business owner. This is a soft question, Kelly. And actually, I just was talking to someone about this of, I don't know really what I want to do. I remember at the beginning of my career, does anyone remember the book, What Color Is Your Parachute? Absolutely. Okay. I read it, no joking, with my highlighter three times. And I read it three times over because I was just like, one of these times is going to tell me what I want to do. <laughs> if I just read it one more time and maybe I highlight a little bit more, like you can only imagine, it looked like a freaking rainbow. And I really struggled to figure out what do I want to do? Kelly, how do you work with someone to get to that? Because at least for me, and it's a great book, yeah. but that book didn't do it for me. And the career I went into, I hated. Oh, no. I mean, the good news about my first job is I hated it so much that I knew very clearly this was not what I was going to do. Yeah. And that's a massive benefit. <laughs> it really is. It was black and white. Yeah. And, you know, Dick Bowles, who's the author of What Colors My Parachute, and he's definitely the godfather of career, right? But some people really like a lot of things. That's why yours was a rainbow. Yeah. I'm a rainbow as well. I want to do everything. I have some clients who are haters. They're like, ah, I don't like anything. You know, when I work with people, I do go through a process to expose people to a lot of different options. And then we do get down to a few things. You know, it looks like their needs and their wants and desires, their skills. I do some assessments, Myers-Briggs and the Strong. But in the end, we, you know, we come down to about three options. I know we're talking about baking a lot today. I say it's like a bake-off. You know, we get three options and we go out into the real world and we give it a try. Yeah. And I just find that only in this like experiential action taking that a winner emerges. And mm -hmm. usually it's pretty natural, meaning it's the one that you're spending the most time on and like you're feeling the most lit up about. For you, Stacey, the first one just didn't work out. There was something 
off about it. Maybe it wasn't a bad idea, but it wasn't like the ultimate idea. Yeah. You. So I always encourage people to test. I'm working with them while they're testing. It's a victory when we cross one off. It's mm -hmm. good information. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Move on to the next. Yeah. I think it's also helpful to keep in mind that it's possible to find joy and fulfillment in such a wide variety of scenarios. You know, I don't do career coaching or anything like that, but because I do a lot of employment discrimination, you know, most of my clients are job hunting or <laughs> looking for jobs or have been applying to new jobs. So many times have had clients who said, I really wasn't expecting to enjoy this as much as I did, but I have this great team now and it's a great culture. What I always think about in this regard is, I had a mortgage broker at Chase who I just loved so much. And he was such an outstanding mortgage broker. I don't know if he's still there. His name's Hatham Gobi. But <laughs> I was like, you know, you can really make the world a better place in, in any role just by being kind and good at your job and caring and pleasant. It's such a wonderful reminder. I would never have thought someone could make the world a brighter place as a mortgage broker, but you can make the world a brighter place anywhere. <laughs> Yeah. Of course, not everyone wants to make the world a brighter place. Maybe if you just want to keep your head down and everyone has their joy. And I think you can find it in unexpected places. I completely agree. And I know you bring so much joy to your work and you also bring so much empathy. And I'd love to actually transition to you, Susan, because for a lot of people, they don't have much when it comes to actual bereavement leave. I don't know if there are any actual legislation out there of do companies have to give bereavement leave? And what does that look like, Susan? There's definitely no sort of particular right to bereavement leave, but there are other rights that a person can sort of cobble together. My top suggestion for someone who's looking to try to take more leave than their company offers, which is probably pretty much anyone who loses a spouse, is to look into short-term disability. Situational depression <laughs> is a short-term disability. I mean, hopefully it's short-term, but short-term doesn't mean any particular time period. We've had clients on short-term disability for a year, two years. Of course, we've also had clients who were penalized for taking their disability. So, you know, we'll kind of get into the be cautious part. But in New York, you cannot be discriminated against based on your marital status. So certainly firing someone because of their widowhood would be illegal. But as with most discrimination, nobody is that overt generally. And I think that when it comes to widowhood discrimination, although 59 is so much younger than I would have expected, Stacey, I mean, that's just a really incredible statistic that's just <laughs> frightening for those of us who are not, didn't think we were sort of approaching that stage of our lives yet. But Having a good lawyer on standby, and to be clear, this isn't something I do. I'm not trying to <laughs> rustle up business. Having a good lawyer on standby and having a good doctor, and if your lawyer and doctor can work together to write a note that says, here's what our client needs, it's always better to have stuff come from a lawyer or just to have a lawyer involved. It doesn't mean you're being antagonistic. You just have to stay positive. I'm so positive when I reach out in these scenarios and I tell my clients the same, like, I'm just really grateful to have someone helping me with this so that I can focus on taking care of myself so I can come back or so that we can focus on in other scenarios, we would say the work getting done. I mean, you, whatever your circumstances dictate, I want to focus on transitioning my duties. And so my lawyer is going to handle the ministerial stuff for me. But the other biggest just piece of legal advice that I give to everyone, in addition to document everything, which everyone knows is lawyers, number one piece of advice, always document everything. And I just want to jump in. So when you say document everything, is it I had a conversation with so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so said, take all the time you want it, yeah. right? Tell me more about what document everything means. Today, with our smartphones, we really are documenting everything. Document everything can mean what you just said, Stacey, which is perfect. Like, yeah, I want to memorialize the conversation we just had. Just want to make sure there's no misunderstandings. But it can also just be sending a text. People, people confuse documentation with formality or a, some sort of requirement that there be formality, which there isn't. As a lawyer, tons of our evidence is text messages, 
Slack messages, Gchat, that is evidence. All of that is evidence and all of that is important. Sending your friend a text or your coworker a text. Oh man, I just talked to Steve. He was so nice. Let's hope Bob is just as nice or <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> all of that is evidence. It never hurts to write things down. And of course, conversely, be reminded that anything you write is always discoverable. I mean, I know we're talking about widows. It's not people who are trying to cheat the system or do anything wrong. It's good to know because you might say something private and you just don't feel like having to explain yourself. Saying don't put stuff in writing, it doesn't mean because you're doing something bad or doing something evil. It's just, do you want to have to show this potentially private message to someone and have to talk about it. I think it's really important also like when we talk about document because discrimination happens more frequently than most people even realize. I mean, I know, Susan, this is your area where you live, but there was a study that just came out by Pew Research Center and they interviewed thousands of women and four in 10 women said that they experienced discrimination at work because of their gender. There are lots of reasons for it, but for widows in particular, where now they are the sole parent, they are now having to care for children, maybe even sick family members, even elderly parents not having that partner, finding that they have to leave work during the middle of the day because their kid is sick. In talking to a lot of widows, so many of them found themselves being discriminated against, being paid less, mm -hmm. given fewer hours, responsibilities taken away, excluded from important meetings, even demoted or kind of put to the side in their career and moved to a different area. Some of them even actually let go. It's shocking it typically doesn't happen all at once. And if someone listening is starting to see these things happen, obviously they start to document and they talk to a lawyer, but do they also talk to their supervisor? Do they reach out to HR? Is HR the right place? Where do you go if you're seeing this? It's like so heartbreaking. It's so horrible. And, and I think there's a real similarity to pregnancy discrimination and discrimination against new parents where some people truly believe deep down, even if they would never admit it even to themselves, that women who have these obligations are just not as good. <laughs> They're just not as smart. They're not as dedicated. They're not as good of workers. And they judge. So I do think it's very important to get it out into the open for a couple reasons. Number one is just because I think a lot of times people don't realize that they are discriminating. They just start holding some people to a stricter standard and they may truly believe, oh, her performance is suffering or, oh, she was never really the right fit or, <laughs> you know, it was never really the role for her. But the main reason is that discrimination is illegal, but retaliation is also separately illegal. If you make a good faith complaint of being discriminated against and the company then retaliates against you, punishes you for making the complaint, you have a potential claim against the company, even if you were wrong about the discrimination. The retaliation is its own separate legal claim. People are understandably very, very scared of bringing up discrimination and say, I'm afraid it's going to backfire. They're going to get angry. And that is a legitimate fear. But it's also important to document and to create a record. And I think just circling back to the trick of trying to be positive and saying, I'm so glad I work at a place where we're going to be able to resolve this together. I'm grateful that I can trust you with these concerns I'm bringing to your attention always erring on the side of just maintaining that congeniality. We should be able to say whatever we want, but we just can't. And we have to toe the line in that respect for our own sake and just preserve the relationships because it's always human beings making these decisions. And it's way worse. To, you know, who cares if you have a case 
after you've gotten fired, you're fired. <laughs> your life is, you know, you're panicked. Things are horrible. So I always try to help people to be proactive and naming what's happening is a big integral part of that. So, so one of the, and I'm so glad you bring that up of like, well, now you're fired. Now, quite frankly, you're really screwed. And if you do have a claim, you're out of work. So many women, they are putting up with this crap because they feel like they have no choices. They have so much financial pressure. So Susan, can she work with a lawyer, start to name what this is happening, and then look for another job? Does this hurt her or follow her or in any way reduce the realm of amazing possibilities in her career if she has discussions or potentially even a legal case against her current or former employer? First, I'll give the caveat, then I'll give my answer because the caveat is small. The caveat is anything can happen. She could piss someone off who decides to go and badmouth her. We can't control that. <laughs> we just can't control what individuals choose to do. And even getting companies to agree to non-disparagement agreements can be tough. I don't want to say there's nothing bad that could happen in the universe of possibilities because that would just be false. I mean, we just don't know. That said, generally speaking, there won't be any blowback. That's because people have a great amount of control over who you list as a reference or a lot of companies will say, as a matter of policy, we only give the name and date. I mean, perhaps in some sort of extraordinary circumstance where there's some wacko with a vendetta, probably whatever sort of legal discussions you find yourself in with your employer will never see the light of day. And that's because it's more embarrassing for the employer than it is for you. Employers don't want it out there that they've been accused of discrimination, whether rightly or wrongly. Whatever they happen to think of the merits of the accusation, it's just an embarrassment. <laughs> it's a negative. So they don't want to talk about it. That is a very common concern that our clients have. We can't guarantee, you know, there's however many billion people on the planet. <laughs> I can't predict what each of them will do. But by and large, it's in the company's interest to keep these sort of things quiet and confidential. And so they usually do. I have encountered other employment lawyers who say, Never quit your job. Don't quit your job because it'll impact your chances. It'll make you look bad. It'll make your damages smaller. If you fire, then you have a case. And so now you have more money damages than a lawsuit. To me, that is like running in front of a car so you can get hit and sue for personal injury. And you have got more money in the lawsuit because your body is more hurt. Like, why would you hurt yourself? <laughs> Just yeah, I'm not, I'm not jumping out hurt. in front of a car because I want to go on vacation, right? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's not it. terrible. We only have one life. Don't subject yourself to harm on purpose. <laughs> why? Don't do that to yourself. And a good lawyer would never suggest that. We have plenty of clients who are still employed, and we reach out to the company and we're like, "Look, the ball's in your court." What do you want to do? And by that point, frankly, if the person wants to leave, it's always negotiable. I mean, it's easier for the company. If they want you to go away, they'll pay you to go away. But if they want to stay and we just want the company to do better and we tell them that, a lot of times they will do better. Or if they don't, then they're even more on notice. And so, yes, you can get more money. But I just think in these situations, you have to just put yourself in your mental health first, especially when we're talking about widows and family obligations. You owe it to yourself to do what's best for yourself in your life. And it just appalls me when I hear that advice. And that's the standard advice I hear all the time. You know, I've been doing this for a dozen years and I periodically check in with lawyers and they all say, do not quit. They're like, it is the lowest level of defense. When I quit corporate, Everyone was tisk, tisk, tisk. They're like, you can't get your unemployment. You can't do anything. You've blown up your whole case. What are you doing? So I'm so glad to hear that from you. I'd like to shout it from the mountaintops. My favorite thing in the world is sending a company a letter saying so-and-so decided she doesn't work here anymore. Like, screw you. Why should you be devoting your talents to a company that sucks? I just... Yeah, yeah. There, there's a lot of hate lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> Throw that advice out the window. <laughs> I loved how we were also talking about mental health. 
that's a huge, huge piece of it. And Kelly, I want to pivot to you because so many people have, you know, a, a three day bereavement or mm-hmm. last two weeks, doesn't even matter the time frame. You're coming back and your whole life has been shattered. How do you show up? And I've talked to women where they went to work mm-hmm. and showed their emotion and then felt they weren't taken seriously and tiptoed around. Another woman that we, boy, we've worked with her now for about eight years. She showed up in a very business-like way, was very present and very productive. And her colleagues, one of them said, are you not sad that your husband just died because she wasn't crying? And so here we are, Kelly. It's kind of like damned if you actually show that your whole life has been shattered. Yeah. And damned if you don't, if you show up in a professional way, because then you're this heartless bitch. I doesn't, yeah, doesn't care that their spouse just passed away. So how do you navigate coming back to the workforce after a loss like this? Yeah. Well, I mean, we're all in the stages of grief. It's a massive loss, whether it was expected or underexpected. So everyone deals with shock differently. I mean, if we're talking about the first three days, two days, it's nothing in the scale of, it's the whole rest of your life to deal with the loss, whatever happens later on. I see this, you know, when people come to me when they've been fired or they've quit or like they've called a lawyer, right? All these kinds of things. And I'm very delicate about it, but I'm also very straightforward about saying, this is very busy time in your life. You're absolutely in shock. Your number one priority is taking care of yourself. So in like those two scenarios, Maybe that was the best thing in the world for that woman to go back to work. That could be her one shred of sanity. Like when my dad died, I went back to work pretty soon. And I was so blessed to be with my clients because one hour at a time, I didn't think about that. I was like super focused on my client, right? So for someone like her, she'll probably have other moments in two years or whenever it is. And the person who emotes up front, maybe she's there because she needs the support. And so, I, you know, I don't think it's really about like, what the better is. Is it better to show your emotion or is it better not? But how can she go back and make sure she's getting the support she needs from her workplace? I guess that's the better question Yeah. versus like right or wrong of what is the best way to do this. How does she get the right support? I wouldn't dance around it. Day one, coming back, have a meeting with your manager and also HR. If you feel like you can trust HR, which that's a whole other conversation (laughs) and say, I'm back. This is what happens. This is my approach. This is what I expect to be ahead. This is how I'm doing. If it's a wise manager, they would say, this is what we're able to do for you. Is there any way that we can like have a little signal between each other, like time (laughs) out when things get like that? And that's how it needs to go. I mean, it's a very humanistic situation. I mean, for the most part, they don't want you to fail. They don't want you to fall apart. But I would say pretty straight communication. I wouldn't just like come back and like sit down at your desk and start working again. I wouldn't do that. One of the women who was let go, her child had a disability. And so significant amount of pressure on her to now be the sole caretaker and was having to take time off to appointments and things like that. If you foresee now, you as the sole caretaker of your children are going to have that, do you sit down with HR and your supervisor and have that upfront conversation? And I'd love to know, Kelly, from like your coaching perspective, and I'd love for you, Susan, from like a legal perspective. Yes, is the answer. Maybe it's possible to have a nice structure around, say, I'm just going to say the child's doctor's appointments or PT or, you know, whatever's going on. It's like, I need to take Michael every Tuesday at four. So that means I need to leave at 3.30, the appointments for an hour. I'll be home. I'll make dinner. I'll be back online at seven to finish the day. So like very clearly, like you're saying, this is when I'm going to be back online. Yeah. And then I imagine, Susan, you're thinking document that. <laughs> I, are you thinking that too? Yeah, and definitely talking that. No, I was also just thinking you asked a question earlier that I didn't answer that I'll weave into my answer. 
You ask, who do you go to? Do you go to HR? Do you go to your supervisor? Kelly, I think, sort of answered this, which is it's a political decision and you need to figure out who your allies are and who's going to be helpful and who's going to be supportive. And that's it. And it depends on the company. Some companies yep. have a great HR department, certainly not all or most, <laughs> but they exist. And you know who's good and who's not. Yeah, you know who has your back and exactly. right, who's going to pull for you and help you along. Right. So I yeah. think it's important to use your knowledge of the dynamics and the interpersonal relationships. If you have a trusting relationship with someone, that's what trust is for. And that's what you built the relationship for is for times like this. It is important also not just to approach things strategically in terms of your allies, but also just to think about what is the output that will be affected or not affected? You know, if I'm this woman, if I have to leave when I forget the Wednesdays at 3.30, but I'll be back online at 7. Does that have any negative impact on the business at all? Because if it doesn't, they shouldn't care. And I think I would put that when you're documenting and memorializing the conversation, say, I really appreciate this flexibility. It will make a big difference to me and my personal life. But fortunately, it won't make any difference whatsoever to the company because it will have no impact on. I don't have children, but back in the day when I was in corporate as a VP, I was doing my MBA and there came one semester that I had to take this one class during basically work hours or wasn't going to graduate. And so I told them, I memorialized it. And every time I had to stand up at 4.30 or 4.45 to go up to Lincoln Center to take my final at Fordham, they were all still shocked. Week 15, they're still like, why are you standing up and leaving the building early? Because Kel's got yeah. her final. Wow. And it doesn't change. It doesn't change. Like Michael's yeah. going to go to the doctor. You still have your class, let alone the class was to make you better at your job. But okay, we'll right. just put that in a box and put that to the side. It's much better than the alternative, which is, you know, if they're watching you like a hawk and micromanaging and, oh, yeah. she's going to leave any minute, just like mm -hmm. she always does. I hope it's kind of reassuring in those situations, like everyone's focused on themselves. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we have flown through our time. What are any parting thoughts that either of you have? I know we've talked so much. Truly, we could talk another hour, but let's start with you first, Susan, and then love to end with you too, Kelly. And then after that, I definitely want you to share your contact information too, because I have no doubt that people are going to be reaching out to you with their own particular situation. So for you, Susan, anything that you want to make sure something we went over or something that we didn't get to that you want to make sure that you include? Yes. I just feel like we didn't really talk about sort of the intersection between gender discrimination and age discrimination in these scenarios. And I mm -hmm. just want to sort of briefly flag that men suffer age discrimination too, but age discrimination is a huge problem for women. It's one of those things that there's a lot of information and resources out there about age discrimination, even on our website, for example, I think we list sort of some common phrases that we tend to see in these cases, young blood, being tired. There's sort of some catchphrases that just tend to pop up. And so I just want people to kind of just be aware and just sort of be able to be on the lookout and articulate those things. Because usually when people are suffering discrimination, contrary to popular belief, no one is looking to be discriminated against. <laughs> Nobody wants that. And you're not sort of looking for it. You're looking around it. You're looking for excuses for it. So I think it's just good to be sort of just familiar with kind of the language and how these cases tend to play out so that you can know kind of what are the common pitfalls and ways to address it head on and transparently like we were talking before. How old do you have to be where you could think, oh, this could be age discrimination or is it dependent also on the industry? There's so many different laws. The federal laws apply to anyone over the age of 40. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's so young, but New York City and state laws, there's no particular age cutoff. So it's really any age. And we tend to see age discrimination against women does vary by industry, but Women suffer age discrimination more if they choose not to, for example, dye their hair or, <laughs> you know, do other sort of cosmetic things. But again, it depends on the industry. And it's the sort of thing where you know where you are and you know kind of what the yeah. environment is. And so you can know if that's the sort of thing you need to keep an eye out or 
for or not. There are yeah. obviously plenty of women in the world who recognize that women's experience and value only grows with age. <laughs> but there's lots of people who don't. Yeah. So I mean, I think the three of us here on this podcast are a perfect example of that. <laughs> we are smart and we are experienced. And I may not be 21, but that's a good favor, a good thing in my quiver. That's super helpful. Anything else, Susan? The one other thing I wanted to very quickly say is part of the reason that it's good having a lawyer is just not even because of the legal analysis, but just because you're showing that you have capital, that you have a support team, that you have sort of yeah. a network of resources like at your back. I never want anyone to underestimate that because at the end of the day, companies, you know, it's all about a risk assessment and you want them to think that you're powerful. So I would even recommend casually drop in mentions of your financial advisor. <laughs> I don't know if you're listeners, like you wear so many different hats, but Stacy is a super brilliant financial advisor. Hire Stacy and casually mention that to your employer. <laughs> it can all be, yeah. you know, <laughs> sorry for the shameless plug, but at the end of the day, it's all about interpersonal relationships and making yep. yourself look good with the side benefit of professionals really do help you and make your life better. Fantastic advice. Giving over to you, Kelly, what are your thoughts? Ditto on making sure you have a good lawyer. Yeah, I can't say and not say that enough. First of all, I mean, if you've lost your spouse, I just want to extend my greatest sympathy to you. You are now on like the other side of your life and life will be different. If you decide to go back to work or get a career for the first time, it's not going to be some super easy breezy task. It's not for anyone. Your particular challenge is that you're looking for a job plus widowhood. People have all these other things as well. But I can assure you that it's totally worth it. There's so many other benefits besides a paycheck to going back to work mm -hmm. at a time when you've had significant loss. Yeah. The confidence building, the network building, the time with other adult people <laughs> time. Yeah. And it's really just a doorway to a whole other place for you. So I know that's kind of more like the emotional kind of stuff right now. But I see people become so empowered and just morph into like some other being that they never knew that they were going to be. When they make all these efforts, they do the step, they get the job, they make the change, the whole family benefits from it. Yeah. And I can't thank you enough for having us be able to end the podcast on a positive piece of note too, because I know I am biased. I love my career. It makes me happy. And trust me, there are days that are tough days. Yep. We all have them. So Kelly, how can our listeners reach out to you? Sure. Because I know quite a few people have questions. They're like, what would Kelly say about this? So a couple of easy ways is I'm on LinkedIn all the time. You can connect with me or send me a message right there. I also do a consult, it's free consult. You could just sign up. It's available all the time. You just go to my website thetruthatwork.com slash consult. That's it. Sign up. Great. And for everyone listening, we are going to put all of that information in show notes. So you can go right to show notes, click right there. Super easy. And how about for you, Susan? How can our listeners get a hold of you? I started my website, crummiller.com. We have information about the different practice areas there. My email is susan at crummiller.com. And my office number, 212-390-8480. I have an amazing team. I'm leaving tomorrow for a couple of weeks. So I'm going to seize this moment to try to get in the habit of saying, reach out to my team. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right there with you. Yeah. We are happy to help. <laughs> Yay. Well, the two of you, I am so grateful that you have taken the time to talk about this extremely important topic. While it's a very heavy topic, I'm leaving with just a very full heart about the resources you provided and just like hope and knowledge that are going to help all of the women listening today. So I just want to say a great big thank you. And I'm sending you a huge hug and all of you listening as well. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Stacey. And thank you for all the work you do so generously for women everywhere. You're a real inspiration to me. This was a eye-opening conversation, not only for me, but I expect for all of you listening as well. 
far too many women are undervalued in their career, underpaid, even unfortunately marginalized by being demoted or fired. This is exacerbated for widows who are finding themselves grief-stricken with more responsibilities at home than they've ever had to face on their own. If you have questions, please do reach out to both Kelly as well as Susan. And if you have concerns about your long-term financial security, I want you to reach out to me. You can reach me at stacy at francisfinancial.com or you can go to our website at www.francisfinancial.com. Our superpower is helping women plan their financial future and make sure that they're on financial track. You deserve financial peace of mind, and this is what we want to do exactly to help you. Thank you for joining us for Financially Ever After, and we'll be seeing you in two weeks. Thank you for tuning in to Financially Ever After Widowhood. If there's a question you'd love for us to answer on the podcast, we can do that for you. All you have to do is give us a call, and the number is 347 382-5580. Let me say that again. 347-682-5580. Whether you're working with an advisor or you're maybe doing it on your own, we invite you to reach out to us at www.francisfinancial.com or you can email me at stacy, S-T-A-C-Y, at francisfinancial.com. Our hope is to be a resource for you to help you also find a great financial advisor, whether that be with our firm or one of our trusted colleagues. Please be sure to like, rate, and subscribe to the podcast and join us next time on Financially Ever After Widowhood.